Okay, folks. Well, I think uh, I'd like to go ahead and call the order, uh, call the forum to order now, please. I'm Connie Nestor, and I'd like to wish you all a hearty welcome this morning. Um, you know, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrew Society which founded the oldest for, um, 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois, later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, and it's located in North Riverside, Illinois. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, muting your uh, speakers when you're not speaking, please, that would be helpful. There's some background noise. But um, I, I wanted to tell you that Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care and all the healthcare services that are offered, or offered there on our campus. Uh, for additional information, please access our website, which is www.chicagoscots.org, and please donate generously to Caledonia. Now, I think um, we'll go ahead and begin our presentation shortly with question answer period at the end with our esteemed guest. But first, we are delighted to have with us Gus Noble, who is president of Caledonia and Chicago Scots with us this morning to greet everyone and to say a few words. So Gus, please take it away. And you're muted, Gus. I make much more sense when I'm <laughs> muted. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so wonderful to, to gather again here for the History Forum and I'm grateful to you, Connie, for, for all you do to to arrange and, and gather us all. Uh, and Donna, it's great to see you again. Uh, we met virtually um, a couple of times at the Scottish North American Community Conference, and I was um, very taken and inspired by the comments that you made during the, the, the couple of conferences that you kindly spoke at. Uh, once uh, you, you spoke about Scottish identity, and, and it was a really compelling uh, presentation that has resonated down the, the, the couple of years with me and continues to give me ideas. So I'm grateful to you for, for the uh, resonance of your, your presentation. Um, I ought to give everybody a, a report from Caledonia Senior Living. Um, we're now almost a, a couple of days away from being two years deep into the pandemic uh, since we locked the front doors of the Scottish home for the first time in over a century. Um, I had this, this moment where I gathered the leadership team and turned the, the key in the old lock and it, it snapped into place with a, an eerie crunch. And we kind of thought to ourselves, what next? And as we all stepped into the unknown, um, I, I have to say that the, the crisis, while as it's been a, an incredible challenge, has revealed who the Chicago Scots and the people of Caledonia really are. Um, I, I recorded a video message shortly after we turned the key and I spoke about the, the things that had sustained the society, the community of Scots in Chicago for, for 174 years as it was at the time, soon to be 175 and then 176 and this year 177, um, how, uh, how we'd been sustained by some very simple concepts of home, family and love. And I, I, I read and, and consult when I, I find myself in, to quote the Beatles, when I find myself in times of trouble, I reach for the archives that I have in my office that go back all the way to 1871. Sadly, we lost everything in the Great Chicago Fire prior to 1871. But in those archives, I hear the voices of the Scots, the early Scots who founded and led and uh, grew the, the, the Scottish society and they all speak of the same things. They all tell us how we got through the crises of the Great Chicago Fire, 
the, the great wars of the world wars, the, the flu uh, pandemic of 1918, um, the Great Depression and Great Recession, um, and they speak of the same thing, home and family and love. And so this video message I recorded shortly after locking the door, I encouraged everyone, both inside and outside those locked doors, to, to keep focused and deliver and um, never forget those things that have sustained us. Life's most important things, home and family and love. And I'm here to tell you that's exactly what they did. The crisis revealed that our very heart, the Scots, are all about home and family and love. And if you look at what the society is, do we, do we uh, gather and celebrate Highland Games and St Andrew and Robert Burns? Yes, we do. Yes, we welcome uh, Scottish authors and uh, businesses and universities and so on. And we talk about Scottish identity. That reminds us of Scotland, of home. Uh, we bring something of home to Chicago and certainly home is a very important concept at Caledonia Senior Living. And family, of course, kith and kin is what ties us all together. It's what Scots have done to keep connection to one another and to support a life. And I'm so proud to stand with every single member of Caledonia and be with people who can have looked the crisis in the eye and had the backbone to, to get through it. Remarkably, 2020 and 2021, 21, only one resident case. It was just incredible. And that was past vaccinations. So as we look at the, the time beyond uh, the two year uh, anniversary, I'm delighted that we open our doors and we have renewed the Scottish home. We have uh, um, reimagined the care we give in two different parts of the home where we have refreshed with new carpets and lights and walls and uh, it, it just looks incredible. I'm so proud of uh, the, uh, the people, I'm so proud of the community and I invite you all to, to come and visit and to consider what, how, how lucky we are as a Scottish community and how proud we should be of this important uh, part of our organisation, Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. So thank you very much. Keep on keeping on. And uh, thanks for your support and your belief in our mission. Donna, I'm really looking forward to hearing your remarks this morning. And maybe you might uh, talk about what home and family have meant to uh, Scots in, uh, in your part of the world and beyond in your studies. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. <laughs> That's very <laughs> funny, I've talked to me there. Um, thank you very much, Gus. Um, just to reflect on that for a moment, here in Scotland, there was a, um, a huge community effort in, in terms of the pandemic to work together as a, a people together to support one another. Um, here in Orkney, we had 48 new businesses started in the first lockdown, and they were all things like food and deliveries and very positive things that enrich people's lives. Um, huge amount of artwork was created. We had a creative competition actually, which was won by a gentleman who turned a, a working lawnmower into a telescope, which worked mm -hmm. so that he could, and of course it was, it was a, on the lawnmower so he could get it out of the wind. And if anybody's been to Orkney, they'll know exactly why that would be. Um, and he said it was so he could not travel on the earth, but he could travel in the heavens with his telescope. So um, the, the first, in Scotland, as always, the community came together in a, in a really positive way. There was a very high compliance with all of the restrictions and so on. And we, we saw the benefits of that in the way that the pandemic um, played out in Scotland and is still playing out in Scotland. Um, uh, the Scottish government provided really strong leadership, as did all of the local authorities and the people themselves. As always, we came together, we worked together. The community was more than the sum of its parts and we managed to get through it. And it was, you know, the being positive, reaching out to people, um, looking after people, going around to them, taking them food, taking care, wearing our face masks, because we know that we wore the face masks not to keep ourselves safe, but to keep others safe. And that was an important thing. And that was something that really resonated with people in Scotland, that they were doing these things to keep everybody else safe, because we were all in this together, as always. And to some of the things I'm going to say today about the lost people of Scotland that I'm going to talk about, I think, will resonate with this. Um, well, why don't we... we... <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. 
I thought you had stopped there, uh, Donna. I, why don't we go ahead and I'll introduce you and we can get started because we're all just terribly excited about hearing from you. Um, this is Dr. Donna Heddle, by the way, and she is the director of the Institute for Northern Studies at Orkney College, which is part of the University of Highlands and Islands. And Professor Heddle is going to speak to us on Celtic and Norse place names in the North and anything else her heart desires because we'll be hanging on your every word, Dr. Heddle. Please, please proceed. Thank you very much, Connie. Well, what I'm going to do today, folks, is I'm going to talk to you about a lost people in Scotland and where we can find the evidence for them. And the people I'm going to be talking about are the Norse, the people that you know perhaps better as the Vikings, and I'll come back to that term in a moment. And I'm going to start off by giving you some background context to the story of the Vikings in Scotland, and then we're going to look at some place name evidence and uh, where we can find the story of the Vikings in the Scottish story as well. The Norse are woven right through the tapestry or the tartan of Scottish history and culture, and it's really time that this was better recognised. But yet, unlike the Dane law in England, the, the Norse occupation of Scotland doesn't have a name. Um, this may be a reflection of the less well-documented nature of the various invasions involved, but it also shows a, a, a lack of popular understanding of the history. By comparison to the, the Roman occupations of Scotland, the Norse kingdoms were much longer lived, more recent, and had a significantly more dramatic influence on spoken language and by extension cultures and lifestyles generally. But they were confined to areas that are relatively remote from our main areas of population today. Furthermore, regardless of the actual impact of the Scandinavian culture, the hereditary leaders of the Scots nation are generally descended from the Pictish and Gallic stock. The Vikings are uh, they're, they're often seen as very much in a negative light and as a foreign invasion rather than as a key part of the cultural polity that is Scotland. And one of the problems here is that the contemporary documentation of this period of Scottish history is very weak. Um, the presence of the monastery on Iona led to um, Scotland being pretty well recorded from the mid 6th to the mid 9th century. But from 849 onwards, when Columba's relics were removed in the face of Viking incursions, we don't have a lot of written evidence from local sources for about 300 years. The sources for information about the Hebrides and Northern Scotland from the 8th to the 11th century are thus almost exclusively Irish, English or Norse. And the main Norse text is, of course, Orkneyinga Saga, which is written in the early 13th century by an unknown Icelandic scribe and should be treated with care. It's, it's a mixture of fact and fiction. I, I like to call it faction there. The English and Irish sources are more contemporary, but probably have led to a bias against the Norse in telling the story. So why do the Vikings have such a negative press? Perceptions of the Norse as plundering, violent, dirty, alien male savages who swooped down out of the darkness of the North in their longships, ravaged the land and left attack elsewhere are prevalent. They don't seem to have a voice of their own. Other people told their story. They're the victims of a very political discourse found in the writings of people like Adam of Bremen, uh, which creates this sense of them not belonging to Scotland, that they're other, that they came and they left very quickly. Um, Adam made them into a scary foreign beast uh, medieval times. They were reinvented as the noble warrior in Victorian times. They were also unfortunately subverted into national, uh, national socialist iconography in the in 1930s. They're all fictions with a political agenda. But the truth is much more interesting and much more illuminating. So let's start with a name. The name Viking is essentially a word that takes a part of their activities and uses it to, to classify them. The word Viking uh, de derives from the noun vic, meaning a creek or an inlet or a small bay. It refers to an activity, not a people. It was originally just to go on an expedition, um, uh, but uh, later it refers to raiding. It does not refer to a people and it does not refer to a culture, although we do refer to the Viking Age in history because that's the time of Viking expansion when they were raiding. Um, and during the Viking Age, the term Viking didn't have a negative connotation. The term applied to a man usually referred to somebody who'd gone an expedition oh, right. on. And we, can, we hear it, we see it quite often in poetry and runic inscriptions, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now I'm just going to share my presentation with you, if you just bear with me a moment. Let me find it now. Do, 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 do. Right. Da. Technology is marvellous when you can get it to work, folks. So if you just bear with me a nanosecond, I should be 
uh, good to go with that. Right. Take your time, Donna. We can see it. Excellent. I'll just start it off then. Do, do, do. Karsh Maha, as we see in these northern parts. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, so there were lots of different names for the Norsemen. Uh, they weren't known as Vikings, but they were known as Wakings by the Anglo-Saxons. Ascomani, the Ashmen, they were known as that by the, the Germans because they left ash behind them. They were known as Lochlanach by the Gaels, the men of the, of the Loch, the Northern Lochs. They were known as Dina, also by the Anglo-Saxons. And they were known as Rus or Ross, the rowers, the, pe the people who rowed things. And of course, they gave their name then to Russia. Maybe we've not mentioned Russia too much today, however. Um, so we know that they were called all of these different things. And so they had a lot of different names and people knew them as that. They, and to the Byzantines, they were known as the Varangians as well, the, the sworn men. And they were actually um, the Norse bodyguard of the emperor in Constantinople um, were an incredibly influential group. The, the, uh, the use of the term Viking to refer to some kind of noble warrior or savage began in the 18th century when there was a revival of interest in Celtic and Norse origin myths. Um, and the use of it, usage of it to describe Norse people generally and aspects of their culture is very much a 20th century construct. This could not be more misleading, actually. The Norse weren't just raiders, but they were farmers and traders and settlers, and they took their families with them when they moved from Scandinavia. They had a settlement strategy, not just smash and grab. They had an ordered, complex societal structure. Norway, Sweden and Denmark all emerged as fully fledged kingdoms during the Viking Age. Now, excuse me, just... excuse me, Donna. I believe uh -huh. we, may, we may be looking at your notes and not your slides oh. at this point. Okay. Oh, that's possibly the case. There we go. Sorry about that. I moved it down the sit there. Yes, thank uh, you. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, so we know that the, 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 the concept of them as being dirty and uncouth savages was something that was also very prevalent at the time. And we know that that was something that uh, people traded upon because in, in medieval times, pagans were considered as a lower form of evolution than Christians. And so considering them to be dirty and pagan and so on was one way of, of making them into lesser creatures in point of fact. Um, so we, we find this coming quite a lot uh, in texts and so on and so forth as well. Oh, I think I've just done that again. Hold on. There we are. Yep, there we are. Technology is marvellous. There we go. So uh, we know that they were actually considered particularly clean by societies uh, that lived with them. Uh, the, the Muslim writer Ibn Rusta uh, noted that the Eastern Norse customarily carried clean clothes with them, for example. Their custom was to bathe every Saturday. And the word for Saturday in Scandinavian languages means bath day, uh, even now. Um, we also know they were very keen on combing their hair. Archaeological evidence indicates a preponderance of combs. They certainly would not have been putting horned helmets on their well-brushed hair. Only one actual Viking Age helmet uh, has ever been found. No horns and none on any contemporary images of helmets either. Nothing could be more impractical for the Norse form of warfare. Shield walls and fighting on ship islands, ships lashed together, do not lend themselves to extravagant helmet displays. So where does this idea come from? Um, well, ceremonial uh, horned helmets do feature in the Nordic Bronze Age some 2,000 years before the Viking Age, but the reinvention of the costume happened at about the same time as the name became synonymous with the people, and that's when we see horns and indeed wings in a nod to classical mythology in helmets. They're essentially a Victorian invention. The Victorian Viking image is particularly entrenched in popular culture today. Hagar the Horrible of cartoon uh, series in Scotland and uh, the Thor film franchise are prime examples. But what did they think they were? Who did they think they were? And this is where we might see some resonance with the Scots today. To the modern reader, the saga is written down in the main by Icelandic monks after the events portrayed give little insight into the Norse mindset. They don't involve internal monologues or reflection on motivation and employ little direct speech. To the Norse, it is not what a man says that counts, it's what he does. A man is judged by his actions and behaving well will attract good luck, a kind of Nordic karma. Their key text, the Havamal, the sayings of the High One, which is a handy, uh, I suppose, 
Bible, if you like, on how to behave uh, throughout your life, peppered with runic and mystic wisdom, notes this explicitly in stanza 75, which is the key stanza to understand everything about the Norse. Cattle die and kinsmen die, thyself too soon must die, but one thing never I ween will die, fair fame of one who has earned it. So basically, I know one thing that will not die a man's good name. They shouldn't really be judged then by the cultural context of other societies, but they may in fact have lessons to teach us. They were by no means just an evanescent plague. They had an ordered and efficient social system based on deeply rooted laws. They set up excellent trading networks wherever they went, but particularly along the rivers of Central Europe, where they founded the Kingdom of Rus, uh, uh, giving, as I said, uh, rise to names Russia and indeed Belarus today. They had a very highly developed sense of community, hmm, sounds quite familiar, as can be seen in texts like Lan Namavok and Laxadal Saga, where they document the lived experience of their communities particularly their genealogies, as knowing where you fitted into the group was imperative. And I mean, I can testify that to that in Scotland. When people say to you, who are you? They mean, where do you fit in? What particular McLeods are you? What particular uh, heddles are you? That's so on. And they had a concept of the individual in, in, in a, in a civilised and democratic society, which is also part of a community. They had a very well-developed and democratic legal system. For example, the word law itself comes from Old Norse, point of fact. They did practice slavery, but most uh, civilizations at that time did. But being a slave in Norse tradition was slightly different. Um, it's particularly in the colonies, you could earn the chance to have your own farm and your own wife and family as well. Each man was judged on his behavior rather than his birth. The main imperative was to be part of the community, whether it's in a family or a group. And the worst punishment that could happen to you was not death, but exclusion from the community, a kind of social death, as many commentators have noted. Uh, this is the kind of uh, equality campaigners claim from contemporary Scandinavian countries that there is less of a gap between rich and poor, and I suppose there's a certain element of that. There was clearly far from being brutish savages with a real desire for order and affluence, and they loved beauty and beautiful things. Another surprise that you might find is that the Norse were quite advanced in the way that their societies were organised along gender lines. The Norse women were in fact far um, uh, better treated in equal rights than in many societies today. And we'll see this when we come to the police name evidence, but we find some evidence of women there. So I'll just see if I can move on to the next. Oh, there we are. Slide three. So where did they come from? There we are. There we are. You can see the Viking homelands A, B and C there. You can see then that they move down the rivers of Europe to uh, Constantinople, which they called Miklagard, uh, that they moved further into Asia, that they moved to Orkney and Shetland, Faroes, Iceland, Greenland, and of course, Newfoundland and places like that. Just move to that picture as well. And that's a, perhaps a, a clearer map, which shows you exactly when they founded all of these different places. And there we can see Kiev, which we may be thinking of today, which was of course uh, a Viking Norse settlement there as well. So in the eighth century AD, the Scandinavian Vikingars um, began to raid and seize large parts of Northern Europe. Um, and some of them even reached, as I say, the coast of North America. The Viking communities abandoned their raiding activities by the 13th century. So that's what we call the Viking Age from about from the middle of the uh, 9th century to the 13th century. We don't know when the first Norse arrived in Scotland. We know that it must have been about um, uh, 795. We've got the first recorded Viking raids there appear with the burning of Rathlin by the Gentiles or what they call the Vikings. And Skye was, of course, pillaged and devastated at that time, as they said. In 798, Iona and other monasteries were plundered, and so it carried on for the next 50 years. It's not known what particular countries these early readers came from, as the sources tend to apply blanket terms, like Loch Lanav that we saw earlier. Um, it's also been suggested that the early raids in mainland Scotland did not start from the Scandinavian countries, but instead from bases set up in the Northern and Western Isles. And I'm in the Northern Isles today, so it's, it seems that we may well have been the baddies in the story when it comes to the raids. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea, but there's still a, a lot of uh, work to be done on that. So what, why, did, why did they move? What's caused this Viking expansion? Um, the suggestion that was uh, for some time it was overpopulation um, is, was a popular one, but it's not actually a particularly successful suggestion. Actually, what happened, if you can see um, up here in the north of Norway, there's very little land between the mountains and the sea. And what happened in Norse tradition is that all the land was parceled up amongst all the children. 
So you could find yourself with a very little bit of land or no land at all. And that, that then encouraged people to go and uh, settle abroad. Also, the honour of going on an expedition on a ship was a great one. And if you got the opportunity to, to do that, you would go. So really, it was an economic thing, but it was also a, a search for honour and adventure as well. So this, they kind of started around about 700, as I say, but we, they soon found themselves in Shetland, Orkney, and so on and so forth, Faroes, Iceland, and so on. But they didn't just go in one direction, as you can see from this map, they went all over the place. And Miklagard, right down there at the bottom there, 839, is indeed uh, Constantinople, as I was saying. So uh, we know too that they were tremendous navigators. They had wonderful ships. And let's just have a look at their ships and see if you see anything very familiar about that. Oops, sorry, click on that. There we are, let's just have a look. So that's the Viking longship, very low, uh, narrow draft there, about 50 centimetres, very practical. And that gives you a kind of idea how it was constructed. And in Scotland, of course, we have the Yule, which is constructed very much on the basis of this. Um, the Vikings were perhaps the greatest sailors the world's ever seen, apart from the Phoenicians. Um, the shallow draft of these warships had several advantages. It meant that the Norse could raid well inland by sailing, sailing far up rivers that were too shallow for typical seagoing vessels of the day. For example, the King of France was very shocked one morning when he hauled back his curtains and discovered a hundred Viking ships in the Seine in Paris because they were able to sail up the river. And that's how we got Normandy. And you might be interested to know that um, Normandy was settled by Vikings from Orkney and Shetland, as well as Norway. So I like to think of the 1066 conquest as the Orkney conquest, not necessarily the Norman one. Um, but uh, the Norse raided only locations to which they could sail quite easily, although they were very, very good at navigating things. And this is one thing that we see in Scotland, the tradition of boat building. In the Northern Isles, we make boats exactly like this today. Let's see if I can just, there we are. And we see the symbols too. This is the, the symbol from the, the Western Isles, from the Corla there of the, the Berlin of Clan Ranald. The symbolism of the Viking boat is still with us in Scotland today. But these terrific uh, ships allowed them to uh, um, basically uh, do their raiding and exploration and so on. They could set up bases deep within enemy territory. And we can see, we can see here uh, how uh, they were very straightforward and simple. They had their uh, shields along the side there. <laughs> it was very basic, no luxury cabins, folks, and certainly no swimming pools. They had a small kist or chest in which they kept all the belongings and they sat on it to do the rowing. So it was a, a very, a very easy to maneuver boats as well. And they were also boats that they could carry over land too. So now we understand how they got here and why they got here. So let's find out a little bit more about them. Let's talk about language, because really we're going to be talking about uh, pl uh, place names in just a moment. Oh, there's another one. So th this is the language. This is uh, the kind of inscriptions that they left. And these are runes. Um, they did not really speak for themselves. They, they left runic inscriptions at the time. They're contemporaneous, contemporaneous. And this is called the Futhark. And um, the Viking uh, uh, alphabet consisted, consisted of 16 letters here, and they're incredibly important. They're not, they're, there's not a huge amount of them, but they're very important because they are the inscriptions that were produced by themselves. We find mo most of them sur survive on erected stones like the ones that you can see in front of you there. Uh, and we found um, 6,578 inscriptions. Uh, the majority of them come from Sweden. And there's a total of 124 from the British Isles, and most of them come from Orkney and Shetland, of course. Um, they are very informative. They, they tell us stories there. For example, in Maze Howe in Orkney, in the, in the tomb there, the, the Vikings broke in there and put graffiti up, which is now hallowed as an archaeological thing. But back in the day, was Kilroy was here, basically. It's things like um, uh, Thorfinn, the greatest uh, carver in the Western uh, world, carved these runes. You have to ask yourself a point. But we can get very valuable evidence about them. And I want you to look at this, this one here that I have here. Um, King Haraldr ordered this monument made in memory of Gormer, his father, and in memory of Thurvey, his mother. That Haraldr who won for himself all of Denmark and, and Norway and made the Danes Christian. Now notice that he's mentioning his mother as well. And this brings me back to the, the idea of women being important in um, Norse society as well. So uh, they had the, the, at the time, they had their own language, they, they wrote, they had lots of poetry as well, but what did they actually speak? 
They spoke a language called Norn. For almost a thousand years, the language of Scandinavian Scotland was a variant of Norse called Norwena or Norn. I'll just give, it to you, give you an example of that up here. Here we are. I'll just read this for you in a moment so you can hear what the Vikings would have sounded like in, in Scotland. And the very distinctive and culturally unique qualities of the Orkney, Shetland and Caithness dialects spoken today derive from this West Norse based sister language in Faroese. Um, uh, and it's an adjective really that uh, comes from Norse, Maine, Norm, and so on. Uh, it was certainly a language with some status. It was recognized as a widely recognized language, and we have documents from Bergen dated from 1485 as the first example um, of the use of the term in Scotland. And it's really distinguished from the present day dialects of the Northern Isles, which we call Arcadian, Shetlandic, or Insular Scots, and known to the folk here as Orkney and Shetland, of course. Um, but uh, it impacted powerfully on the place names of the Northern Isles, as you would expect, and we'll come to where we find it elsewhere. Soon. But I'm going to read this to you, and I'm going to see if you can work out what this actually is. Favari ir i Kimri, heller ir i nam thita, gila costum thita kuma, vea thina mota vara gorto yon sina gorti Kimri, gavas da and da dalek bro voras, forgive us sina vora. Sin viver give sindara muthavis. Leave us in ye in temptation and deliver us from alt ilt. Amen. Now I think the, you'll have guessed that that's the Lord's Prayer in Norn. So that was the language that they spoke. But where do we find evidence uh, for, these, for these people? This is the language that was uh, um, in many ways here before Gaelic, certainly in the very north of Scotland. So how can we find the Norse in Scotland today? And we can, lose, we can use the last remnants of the Norse in the landscape, the place names. So now we're going to have to turn into Sherlock Holmes and look at place names. And place names tell us about people, they tell us about their relationship to their landscape and about settlement pa uh, patterns. The Norse naming conventions are delightfully direct in most cases. Either a place belongs to somebody or is identified in navigational landscape or resource terms. We can deduce a lot about the extent of uh, nature of Norse society in Scotland by investigating and unpacking the names of the settlements. For example, one of the many reasons that the Norse heritage of the Hebrides and Skye, and I know Skye is very dear to Connie's heart, um, is so difficult to unearth is that the place names are given in Gaelic and English only and do not drill down to the source material. Um, for, uh, for almost a thousand years uh, it was Norse and uh, they were used. Um, so uh, it's now buried in the landscape. It would have been widely spoken, but it's now literally buried in the landscape under layers of, of uh, um, English and Gaelic. It's the third substrate layer down from a surface glossing of, of Gaelic and English. So let's have a, a, a think about some place name elements which are common to all three island groups and tell us the story of the Norse in Scotland. Now, I'm just going to tell you the place names things and then I'm going to show you some maps with these place names on them so you can see them. But just explain what the, the, the place name elements are. Some place name elements are very obviously Norse. For example, the following selection, Dalar or Dale, meaning valley. This is quite a straightforward place name element which occurs all over Scotland, including uh, Clydesdale, for example. The interesting thing about Dale that tell, what it tells us about the Norse in Scotland is how long they've been there. This is a later place name and it refers to a place for leisure activities. For example, we have Helmsdale in the, in the north of Scotland, that would be Yelmundersdale, and that would be a place where they went hunting and so on. So it, that's something, that's the de development of society that happens after you've had your basic farms developed in your larger settlements. Laxdale is a very popular version of this. We have several of those, that is of course Salmon Valley. It's also found as D-E-L, as in Rodo, which is Rood Valley or Holy Valley. We also have Vic, which means bay. This is usually seen as Wick in the Northern Isles and Vig, Vic or Ig in the, in the Hebrides. And uh, it's, it's interesting because some, some names that are seen as particularly romantic and Gaelic, like Tarskavig um, on Sky, beautiful village, that's Torskavik, that's Cod Bay. Um, so uh, we find that, that there's a vast amount of these names there. We also have Kletter, meaning rock or cliff. Um, so we, we find that that's a very popular one. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of the uh, American director Richard Linklitter, but uh, he's certainly got Arcadian extract, Arcadian extract because the, the letter bit at the end of his name is Kletter. We also have Geo, meaning uh, Chasm Cleft Inlet, which appears in Orkney, Shetland, Caithness is Gale, and in Gaelic is Gale. 
and we have quite a lot of them. We have Gia Askatan, Herring Cove, for example, and Gia Nanskarif, uh, Cormorant Inland. We also have Val, meaning hill. Hesterval on Lewis, for example, which comes from Old Norse Hester, a horse, which tells us that they kept horses on the hill and where they grazed them. And of course, we have EY at the end, meaning island, which is usually rendered as AY in Scotland. Um, we have uh, lots of, of different places um, called things like that, Langy, the Long Island. Here in, in Orkney, it's very, very specific. Westry, the West Island, um, Stronsey, the Stormy Island, uh, Shapmsey, Helbandi's Island, Hoy, the High Island, and so on. Flotte, the Flat Island. And Ness, of course, meaning promontory and headland. Um, this is very, very common and sometimes leads to tautologies like Point of Ness, which both mean the same thing. And Scare, of course, to finish up with. Um, a rock in the sea becomes scare in Gaelic and scary in English. I don't know what a scary is. Um, perhaps more significant in the Norse story are the, the following three place name elements which are prevalent all over Scotland, but more buried perhaps in the place name than the examples I gave before. They're stater, meaning dwelling or farm, and this is one of the old, oldest Norse place name elements. Very popular choice in Norway before the Viking expansion. Um, and the stater place names, usually with a personal name element, give us the earliest indication of Norse settlement patterns in these areas. Uh, we find them, it's usually very buried in Gaelic as sta, and we find places like Mialasta, which is Njal's farm, or Mangersta, which is Magnus's steading, very well buried there. And the, another one is Setter, meaning township or shearing, um, and that's a very early place name as well. So it tells us how long these places have been here. Now, in Orkney and Shet Shetland, it's Setter, but in the Hebrides, it's Shudder. So examples include Grim Shudder, which is Grim's dwelling or shearing. Um, exactly the same as the Orkney place named Grimsetter, which is actually the name of our airport. I'm sorry to say that popular names for boys in the Norse period in Scotland were things like Grim and Glum, I'm afraid. Uh, it was a very popular name. Um, we also have um, Bolstatter Farm. It's one of the oldest and most prevalent Norse place name elements, and that's actually what I called this talk, Bolstering Bolstatter. Bolstatter settlements are important and sizable central farms in fertile areas, and they indicate very early uh, settlement. And I'm going to show you a map in a minute to show how prevalent they are and how they have been, that Bolstatter has been changed. So the place names appear in many forms from Bist, Buster, Bust, Buster, don't worry about this because you're going to see it on the screen in a minute, Bust, Bus, Bol, Paul, and Bo in traditionally Gaelic speaking. Uh, areas. And we have, for example, the place name Olipool, which sounds very Celtic, but actually is Olaf's farm. And um, the the influence on the Norse languages made the B of Bol Stather become P. It's a, it's, so it's a voiceless for a voice consonant. But don't worry about that too much because that's a technical term. But place names can provide us with some societal illumination too. As I've said, the Norse were quite advanced in the way that their societies were organised along gender lines. We can see an example of this in a couple of place names in Lewis, which I discovered with what appears to be a female personal name element. Yorapi is Yorin's farm and Yoradale is Yorin's valley. Now this tells us quite a bit about her personal status and the ability of women to own property and run a business in the Norse settlements. This is not the norm elsewhere in medieval Europe where women were seen as lesser beings and chattels of men, generally uh, owning no properties themselves. Now I'm not arguing, despite the fact that the Scotsman bannered this all over their page uh, in an article once, that the Norse were all feminists, but they appreciated that women were crucial to the success of settlements. Most women were subordinate to men and did make their lives in the home, but even there, they wielded real power. Norse women had substantial legal rights, which are rigorously uh, detailed in great law books, such as the Grey Goose Laws of, of Iceland. They could inherit from their husbands and children. They could divorce an unsatisfactory husband. You went to the thing in the parliament and you explained what a bad husband you'd got. And they said, that is terrible. Would you like another one or would you prefer not to have a husband at all? But you could keep your dowry and children. They could function as an official head of the household. Women in Britain did not receive all of these rights until the Victorian era at the earliest. Um, taking the, the thing or the parliament, which was not like a parliament as we would understand it, it's more of a conflict resolution meeting. Um, colleagues have noticed that there were five categories of women who could appear at the parliament. Widows, uh, ring women, women with no near male relatives who could inherit lands and valuables, women disputing with other women, women who are head of a household due to uh, illness, um, and witnesses. It's extraordinary when you think about it. It certainly was not the norm in Europe at the time. 
Um, and they also could play a significant role out with the home. They could run the family businesses when the men were the way, were away. And there's plenty of evidence from runestones that they could run businesses themselves, just as our Yorin seems to have done. There she sits on the map, being quietly extraordinary and given a prime example why drilling down to the original place names is so essential. So Norse society was organised, but not overly hierarchical, particularly in the lands in which they settled. There was an equitable, community-based, independent, outward-looking society with a good marine industry. What's not, like, not to like and what's not to recognise? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to look specifically at some maps uh, and some place name evidence so you can see what I've been talking about. OK, now when we're looking for the Norse substrate in Scotland, um, it's very, very obvious to us that we can see it in the north of Scotland and the Northern Isles. And I just want to show you how close these place names are to the original uh, Norse by uh, replacing them with the old Norse. So we can see there we've got Tongue, we've got Thursa, we've got Stroma, Duncan's Behead, Wick, Wharton, Latheran and so on. So what happens if I take those place names away and I put the Norse ones up? There we go, not that much difference. Straumi, Dungansby, Vic, Laha, Vatten is the same as what in Thursa. The interesting thing about Thurso in the north of Scotland is that folk memory has clearly remembered the original pronunciation because people in Thurso call it Thursa, like that, Thursa there. Tunga, we can see there, a tongue is a narrow spit of land. We can see that over there, we can see Brora for Brora and Hjalmundsdal for Helmsdale, as I was mentioning. So, so that's clear enough. We can see that, we understand, we're expecting to see, in the north of Scotland, we're expecting to see Norse place names like that. But let's explore a wee bit further afield. Um, and these are some of the, play, the place names that I was talking about, the place elements there, the Nis and the Bat and Borg and Vic, Tarbot, Gyo, Val, Kirk, Holm, Vat, I and Fjall that we can find there, but they're buried in a Gallic substrate. So let's see if we can find some evidence for these uh, names here. Okay, Stornoway, that might surprise you to know that that is a Norse name, that means Steerage Bay. Brodick is the wide bay, Brodick and Aaron. Collinsey there is Colbine's Island. Far in the north there refers to the plain. Halkirk is the place of the high church in uh, Caithness. Malig is Gull Bay. You can see, you're starting to see it, I hope. You're seeing the aches and the X and the, the things that are buried in there. Rogart uh, is the red enclosure, Rogart there. Ulva, now you might think, and some of you who are as old as me might remember at school learning the poem, um, the, uh, Lord Allen's Daughter. Or who is this that would cross Loch Isle, this, this dark and stormy water? Or um, I'm the chief of Ulva's Isle and this Lord Ullin's daughter. Well, Ulva means Wolf Island. So you, you, it's well buried there. Sunart there is Swain's Fjord. Slate is a plain, again, narrow plain. So let's have a look then. I was, when I was telling you about the place name elements, I was talking about Dalar, the deals. Now you can see there, with the, all the place names that have Dale in them. That tells you exactly where the Norse were in Scotland and they were a lot further down than you might think. So we have uh, Quendale in Shetland, Helmsdale we've mentioned before, Laxadale, that was the Salmon Valley if you remember, with a number of them in the Herbides and on the west coast of Scotland. Loch Boysdale we have as well, Udale, Saddle down there in uh, Isla, Clydesdale right down there, uh, at Glasgow. In there. We also have Annandale and of course that's very famous for being the uh, the home uh, the home place of Robert the Bruce. And we have Dibberdale. So we can see that quite clearly. We can see the, the duller ones. We, we can recognise them right away. We can say to ourselves these are Norse. Oh there's no one going to. And Roddle. Now notice how the deal has changed now Rodel is over in the island of Lewis, and that means Rood Valley, that's a holy place there. So, so see how things change uh, with the pronunciation as well. Now, if we look at uh, Bolstander, we can see standard names here. We can see that it's Bost in the Western Isles. We've got Lurbost there, Harbost. So we've got sort of, uh, Muddy Place, High Place, Garabost, Showbost, all sorts of different ones there. But it starts off, Bolstander becomes Buster. So we're going to go on a little tour around Scotland, having a look at these names. 
We've got Curb Buster there in uh, the Northern Isles. Scrabster, notice that the U has dropped. That's Scrabster on the north coast of Scotland. Camster in uh, Caithness. But then notice Rizabus over there in Isla again. So the bull stutter becomes boos. So it's even more varied. Olapool, I was mentioning before, it's the same place name element. It's It would be Olabus, Olabus but it becomes a p because their voiceless sound replaces a voice one. You know, when people make a, um, a joke about Highland English, they always, they always talk about chalk and chessy and chini and things like that. Well, that's the same kind of thing that's happening there. Erebel, right there on the north coast, Eric's farm. So we've got a bowl there as well. We've got a pool, we've got a bus, we've got a bus, we've got a buster, we've got a stir. Good heavens, what else can we have? Oh, we've got something else, we've got skeagle. So they drops everything completely apart from the first part of this element. Volstad or Skibo there in uh, Sutherland, Embo in Sutherland, and so on. So we can see, actually I'll come back a little bit once I'm mentioning that, too quick, on the, too quick on the draw there folks with the buttons, but we can see that this place name which starts off as Volstadr is buried all the way around the coast of Scotland. Again it shows where the, the Vikings were, this is a very very old place name element, so this is a particularly accurate representation of where they would have been. Now moving on then to Setter, and uh, now this is something that's particularly prevalent in the Western Isles and Skies on the Shudder names there. I've given you a couple there, Geshudder and Shulashudder there as well. But we have Grimshudder, that's Grim's farm there. Shudder, just the farm. Ayrshudder, the uh, eastern farm. Gershudder, Lynnshudder, Turinashudder, that's a, another uh, personal name one. They're very fond of them. So again, you can see, you can see how intensely um, uh, Shetland there, which is the, the island group in the box there to the, in the top right hand corner, Shetland was clearly densely um, covered in place names called Setter. So that it tells you a lot about when Sh uh, Shetland was settled. I'm not worried with that today, but you can see the pattern in there where we would expect to find these place names. Now if we look at Stutter again, we can see that they are slightly more in the island groups. I don't know if you can see that clearly on the maps there, but they certainly are. So what are we talking about there? Tulsta. Now see, notice in the Northern Isles, it's stutter and it's become, you can see what happens with the Gaelic place names. It's the first part of the place name element that's kept. So Tolsta, not Tolstutter. Mangersta, uh, that's Magnus's farm again. Mialista, that's Mial's farm. Skarista, um, that's the Bray farm. Berista, another um, personal name. We find them there. So we can find the story of the Norse quite readily in the place names. They are there, they are buried so. Um, and, th and that is something that, uh, you know, it can be quite difficult for people to see because when you actually, if you look on any websites or anything, they just tell you what the place names mean. They usually tell you uh, what they are in English and Gaelic or Scots or whatever it might be. Um, and one of the problems that we have in, in many ways, uh, just to finish up because I'm very conscious of time and I don't want to keep you too long folks, um, one of the problems that we have with the Norse is they're not very visible in the landscape. They didn't leave big um, Neolithic circles or anything like that. Uh, I mean, for example, I was just going to inadvertently went on to that. That's the site of the Parliament in Shetland. Because what they did is they moored their boats and they had their meetings for two or three weeks and then they went away. So they're not there in a very grand way in the landscape. But I think there's a couple of things that we can finish up with, for example, is that they're in our culture, our legal system, for example, the fact that we have juries at all is down to the Norse. Although uh, they tend, <coughs> excuse me, they tended to increase the size of the jury due to the seriousness of the crime. And they did not, of course, work with a penitentiary system. You went and fought it out on a small island at an agreed tariff and so on. So there's legacy there, not just law and so on. But there's everyday legacy. Maybe the, the Vikings are buried very deeply within us on a very everyday level. And uh, one aspect, let me see if I have a slide on that one. Oh, sorry. One aspect that they left is the shape of the houses that we live in, which people don't always realise. They change the shape of the places that we live in. Before the Norse came to Scotland, we lived in cloverleaf houses or round houses. The long houses that we know today, and you can see the one at the bottom there, the kiln at the end there, the kind of round semicircle thing, that's where they brewed the beer, which was also very important. Um, they didn't bring that with them, but they did bring herrings and oatmeal and other things as well. 
So on a very personal level, in the houses that we live in and our names, and I'm very delighted there's a McLeod in the audience because I'm proud to mention it, um, our personal names, us as individuals. So we've talked about place names. Let's talk about names of people for a moment, just to finish up. Stand up, Lachlan, the Norseman, or Lachlan, I think Gaelic. MacLeod, son of Leot. Macaulay, son of Olaf. McSween, son of Swain, and many, many more. And many Scots take great pride in their Scandinavian ancestry. For uh, example, Clan MacLeod of Lewis claims its descent from uh, Leith, who was uh, in tradition a younger son of Olaf the Black. Clan MacNichol of Skye also claimed Norse ancestry and occasional references are made to the idea of Scotland joining the Nordic circle of nation in modern uh, political debate. Clan Gunn, very proud of their warlike natures. So just to finish up with folks and thanks for your patience. Uh, the Norse were settlers and traders who left their imprint on our legal system, our boat building techniques, our appearance. Um, and I have a personal uh, theory about where Red Hair came from, and that's another story. Our literature, our place names and our languages, both Scots and Gaelics. They were not alien, they were us. They did not leave, they stayed, they're here. Thank you very much, folks. Wow. Well, I got cold chills down my spine when you said they're not alien, they're us. I, I find that whole concept very exciting. And I, when I did my DNA research, Donna, I found that I'm 30, roughly 30 percent um, Scandinavian or Norse. But let's open the floor to question and answer for Professor Heddle, please. Don't be shy, everybody can unmute your mics and turn on your cameras and we'd love to have some discussion. Thank you. I think probably people are needing to do what we say in this country, lie down with a wet cloth on their forehead, perhaps um, after too much information. But uh, it fascinates me that people don't, you know, that we, I suppose really what happened, people say, well, why didn't why people why didn't people choose the kind of the Norse tradition in Scotland? And at the end of the uh, um, 18th century, two really big things happened in the world. Well, of course, a pretty big thing happened in America, too. But um, there was uh, two things that happened in Europe. One was the French Revolution and the other one was the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution meant that people, people's way of lives changed completely. You know, for a Scottish and a Highland farmers, a 12th century Highland farmers way of life is substantially the same as the 17th century Highland farmers way of life. You bring in the Industrial Revolution, we start to look at manufacture factories, moving for work, things change. People no longer um, just live in the same small place that they always lived and married the girl down the road and so on and so forth. They move. The other thing that happened was the French Revolution with society as a structure is completely turned on its head. Now, for uh, the church had told everybody for so many years, just stay in the space that God has allotted you and you'll get your reward in heaven. People start to look at these things differently. They move for work. Then, of course, what happens is that people, people need something to cling on to. So we see the rise of the origin myths. And the origin myths are very much a Victorian construct, uh, born out of romanticism with a capital R. And therefore, people choose what their ancestors were, if you like. And there were two main origin myths. There was the Celtic origin myth. That's the, you know, Finn McCool and all that kind of thing. And there's the Norse origin myth. Now, Scotland chose the Celtic origin myth, of course, fostered by the, the poems of Ossian, who, you know, that was a, a, something that people were yearning for after Culloden, after the... the the decimation of the Highlands, where um, James McPherson is about 20 or so years after Glodden purported to find these these, Aussie, these poems written by Ossian, the son of Finn McCool and so on and so forth, which told of the great heritage of the Celtic peoples and so on. So Scotland chose that heritage. The Northern Isles chose the North her Norse heritage. England chose the Anglo-Saxon heritage. You know, they chose to look back to that kind of uh, idea. And, and if any of you are fans of Lord of the Rings, that's exactly what J.R.R. Tolkien is trying to do in Lord of the Rings. For, for him, it's not all about the wizards and stuff. They're quite cool too, but it's really about the writers of Rohan, who are the Anglo-Saxons. He's giving, a, he's making a myth for Middle England with that. So in Scotland, the myth then was that we we're all Celtic and we flapped about in, in Tartan and so on. As you all know, Tartan is wonderful, but it's, you know, Sir Walter Scott has a lot um, to do with um, what modern tartan looks like and, and modern 
the, the concept of more, the Scottish cultural identity. So Scotland chose this, this, this Celtic identity and the, the Norse who did not write down their own story become evanescent creatures who come and go. When in point of fact, they absolutely stayed. They made us the people that we are today in so many ways. The fact that you could achieve, that you could become something, you could make something of yourself. You know the good old Scottish term, a lad of perts. I don't know why it's never a lass of perts. I maybe have to take an issue with that. But it's a lad of perts that you can you can achieve by education, by improving yourself. You know, we, we never had in Scotland in the same way a feudal system as they had in England. You know, you know, if you were a worthy person, you could be friends with the king. And I'm thinking here, of course, of James VI and George Herriot, who went on to leave his money to found the, the school in Edinburgh, the public school bears his name, but George Herriot was a goldsmith. OK, I'm not saying the fact that he didn't have plenty of money did not help. But the fact of the matter is that they got on very well. They spent a lot of time together because James VI appreciated George Herriot's, um, you know, honest ways and, and well-educated. Um, another thing too about Scotland that made us different is what we think of as the power of education. Women in Scotland were educated um, much, much earlier than women in England, for example, because when the Reformation came in, they said that a decent woman should be able to read her Bible and do her household accounts. You see, that's the whole reading the Bible in your own language was so key to the development of the Reformation. So we see schools for girls at a much earlier age than the rest of the United Kingdom. So education is incredibly important and the notion of that and these these are things that were important to the Norse who you were where you came from what your community was um justice uh, beautiful things literature maritime you know uh, <laughs> it's so obvious to me in so many ways where that part of our culture is within us and you were talking Gus was talking at the, uh, the beginning about community and so on and so forth well the, the Norse certainly had the, the greatest sense of community and, and they would do things for the community. Um, you know, they would work together to create things and they understood about, as we have Scots gone all over the world and created settlements, they did that too. And that's why they thought women were important because everybody had a role to play in the new world that they found. And that's why I love to tell the story of the, the, the Norse part of Scotland because it is very prevalent. And I will just maybe allude to the old red here while I have your attention, because this is a this is a theory that came to me. Now, I have one male child who is absolutely gigantic and has red hair, right? It's huge. We don't even look like the same species, folks. We can hardly get in a, a photograph unless they take it on a slant. But when he was a little boy, he went to school and I looked at his primary class and I thought, out of these 20 children, there are five of them with the red hair. That is statistically very unusual. So I've done some research into it and I've discovered that, uh, well, I mean, I haven't discovered, other people know this, but what I did with the information was this, is that in the world, about one to two percent of the population is red here. Europe, five to seven percent. Scotland, ten percent. Orkney, thirteen percent. Highest level of red here in the world. So I asked myself, why is this? And I realised that you could map preponderances of red here to static Norse populations. Uh -huh. so people uh -huh, yes, it's it a good moment. It's still a work in progress, which is why I'm, you know, so I'm giving you the klaxon of warning here um, about this. But it's very interesting how static groups, because Orkney was very static for a long time. It was handed over to Scotland in, in 1472, February, one February afternoon, 1472, and then became a backwater rather than the major player on the um, international scene that it was became a backwater and the population was indeed static and you married the girl down the road and so on and so forth. So um, I'm working on this at the moment because people assume that red hair is a Celtic gene and originally it will have been in the sense that the Celts came through Anatolia and right across Europe, the proto-Celts, but it's become, I would argue, associated with Norse populations along with the Dupetrin malformation, you know, the, with the fingers going to the hand, which has been established as a, Nor a Norse um, gene and so on. And of course, Orkney also has the highest preponderance of multiple sclerosis in the world. And a lot of research is going on on that at the moment to see whether it is a genetic preponderance. So, um, but I feel that we're, we're like the letters in a stick of rock. The Norse are like the letters in the stick of rock that is Scotland's cultural identity. You can't see them unless you look for them in the stick of rock. You can't see them from the outside. So that's why I'm waving the flag um, uh, for the Norse, because they are all, I'm looking at Connie's lovely hair there and thinking that that's clearly part of our 30% of the, the Norse uh, genes there too. But um, if, if, I'm very happy to answer any questions or, on anything at all, but I want you, next time you look at the map, oh, somebody's waving. 
Yeah, um, it's an interesting speech. Uh, uh, sorry, the lecture you were giving. Um, oh. I have a sister-in-law who lives in uh, the Wirral in Hoy Lake, up near Liverpool. Is Hoy Lake uh, Scandinavian? Well, you see, that's interesting because if you look at how the Scandinavians came into the British Isles, um, what we call the Dane law in uh, Yorkshire and places like that, and right across there, that, that was settled by um, Danes and Swedes in the main, where there's the Vikings or the Norsemen that came to Scotland and Cumbria and Wales were Norwegian. So they are slightly genetically different. But in places like the Wirral, you get a lovely crossover between the two groups. So I would absolutely, I will, I will investigate that for you, but I would absolutely say that that would be, that would absolutely be a Norse name. Did you say that Hoi means like a highland? Hi. Or something? Hi. <laughs> oh, this is, yeah, okay. And so this is Hoi Lake. And, uh, oh, by the way, Daniel Craig, uh, 007, he's from Hoi Lake. <laughs> oh, is he? Well, you might like to know that his first wife was at school with me. Um, she used to, she used to, I went to an all girls boarding school in Edinburgh and she used to play my lover in the school play. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we used what to about, do classical plays is, and so on. Is Liverpool, is that a, anywhere related to a Scottish, uh, not Scottish, but a Scandinavian name? No, that, that one isn't, that, that, that one is not, no, that's, um, harks back to quite a Brythonic uh, name there. It's, it's, it's more aligned to the, the kind of Celtic thing. Oh. Yeah. But it's really interesting. You see, the thing is, of course, the, we've got to remember too that pe spelling was not a thing until the end of the 18th century. Shakespeare, all the different versions of Shakespeare's name, not once does he spell his name the same way, right? Because it really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, it's not a thing. And so when we're dealing with place names, we quite often have to deal with idiosyncratic spellings um, and so on that change the, se the, the sense or, you know, uh, it's, it's like people who came into the United States and people uh, who were registering them perhaps didn't catch their surname properly or whatever it might be and wrote it down in a different way. Well, this is the same kind of thing that happens with place names. So we really have to go back, back to the original sources to find out what the original thing was because it becomes misinterpreted and you know, over many, many years it, it changes. And we find too in Scotland that we, we, have, we have our Pictish substrate, we've got our Norse substrate, we've got the Scots substrate, Gaelic substrate. We may find that places have the same name and we don't realise it. Perth and Creef mean the same thing. Perth means trees in Pictish, Creef means trees in Gaelic, right? Crave. But they're the same thing, they're the same thing, which is why the symbol of our Perth College as part of the University of the Hands and Hands is a, is a tree, for obvious reasons. But I think there was somebody coming in there, was that, did I see? Um, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> was there any uh, remnant of anything in music left uh, by the Vikings? Any of uh, their language? Any? Well, we have, well, they were very, um, very fond of music and they were very fond of, you know, just in the same way the bards did in the um, Celtic tradition, they would have performances and so on. And that's why sometimes people find the sagas difficult to relate to because they're not being performed. That we we're just reading them on the page. Mm -hmm. We've not got the music going with it, you know, the, the knowing look perhaps of the person who's telling the story, to, alluding to something, drawing us into the tale. Um, so yes, we still, we do have Viking melodies, we have Viking instruments. If you come to Orkney, I'll show you them. Uh, we have them in the museum here, so absolutely, absolutely. They loved all of that kind of thing and they would make them very beautiful with inlays and so on and so forth. And we still, we have Viking motifs in songs and so on and, and poems and the last speakers of Norn I suppose died out just at the beginning of the 18th century so we still have remnants of songs and stories and things that have been written down but obviously have probably changed over time and tunes. Um, I'm, tunes. I'm in retirement and um, I have now taken up music I knew nothing about music but I'm taking ukulele but my goal is to pick up an, uh, an old instrument, learn Gaelic, some Gaelic songs. And because um, <clears throat> my mother uh, was a MacLeod and she had like the Celtic voice, I don't know, the it's very pure, you know, um, I have some of that and I'm finding I have a, a little bit of talent. So if I wanted to learn Gaelic, if I wanted to learn anything of this to revive some of the ancient uh, songs, maybe the Viking songs, or an instrument, where would I go? 
to do that? Well, um, you could do that at Sol Morostig, which is our Gaelic college on Sky. Um, amusingly enough, t- two of the three words in that place name are indeed Norse in origin. Um, <laughs> so, so, Sol means barn, but Ostig is Ostvik, East Bay. Uh, so, How do you spell uh, that? Uh, Sol is S A B H A L, S A B H A L, Mor, M O R, so big barn, you see, Sol Mor, and Ostig. Um, O-S-T-A-I-G just as we were looking at in the presentation it's Vic, egg becomes Vic okay. and that's our Gaelic College in Sky and you can do courses from where you are um, uh, in America, you can do courses with them, distance mm-hmm. or whatever and so on and so forth but we, they have a wonderful music uh, programme as well and they have wonderful residential courses in the summer if you would like to come along and, Oh and I definitely will, I've got fine beautiful, stu- beautiful setting Beautiful setting <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Okay, I'll do that. Jody, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, you were talking before about the health issues, and I read an article that talked about um, the uh, Norway has the highest incidence of heart disease and heart attacks. And I'm wondering if anybody's done any studies of areas in Scotland where there's a higher incidence of heart disease and heart attacks and try to tie it to whether those were initially Norse um, communities. Now, I don't think anybody's tied it to Norse communities, but there's certainly been a lot of research done on heart disease in Scotland, particularly in Glasgow. Um, Glasgow men have a significantly lower life expectancy Um, than the rest of Scotland, which takes down the Scottish national average, actually quite a bit. The life expectancy for somebody in the north of Scotland, a man, is 79. In Glasgow, it's nearer 60. Wow. Um, Yes, and that's got an awful lot. There's an awful lot of story there to unpack. There's been some social engineering taking place there too. But it's an interesting fact that a very high level of heart disease in Glasgow. (laughs) But nothing, unfortunately, connects it to the north in any specific way. Thank you. There was another disease. What are the other genetic health problems that you were noting? That yeah, the Dupuytren malformation with the fingers curl into your palm of your hand, and you end up with a hand that looks like that. Dupuytren's contractor. That's the one. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, and that's certainly been um, identified as an Norse gene. Absolutely. Um, I've got it right here. Oh, uh, well, my goodness. And hold, then you up. This. Hold, hold up your hand. I can't see very much. Okay. And uh, given that Donald uh, bears the fine surname of McLeod, I think that proves my case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, Donald, uh, that's an, Donald's got Scotland encapsulated there in his name, the Donald, the, the Celtic name, and uh, McLeod. Donald, of course, meaning world ruler, which is quite... Uh, if you're going to give your child a name, let's go for it, all the way down the line. <laughs> but he has, his, he has his Norse component at the end there. It's also Rh negative blood, one of the um, DNA related. Um, is there a higher propensity for that in the population? Well, it is, it's interesting that certainly um, one of the, the most popular blood group in Orkney is B negative. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, which is unusual, you know, uh, that's an unusual one. Mm-hmm. And that we think that actually goes back further than Viking times to Scarabri, uh, the Neolithic um, bloodlines as well. My mother was Irish negative. Um, and um, is there also, she also had this odd characteristic, her uh, wrist bone was protruding like, like an inch up. Do you see that in any of the population? No, I, I don't know about that one specifically, I'm afraid, but uh, it, could, it could well be. It's, it's very interesting when you start to uh, map th- things like that. For example, um, I have, my blood group is A, and that's usually associated with uh, nomadic okay. peoples. And uh, I do have the good old Scottish cheekbones here that are quite high up. Beautiful cheekbones. Uh, but you know that that could, and the, the way my eyes are set, my husband always thinks that I look very like the Icelandic singer Bjork. Um, <laughs> um, and, he, and, he, and I don't. 
I don't, right? But every time I go to Iceland, he says to me conversationally, were you mobbed in the street? And I said, no, because I don't look like her. But she, what we do have is similar is there's a picture of her at two and me at two that are almost identical. There's about three days between us, um, birth-wise. And uh, I can certainly see at that, the youthful stage, the same thing that she has, which is quite a northern thing with the cheekbones up here like that and the, the eyes set in the way they are. So, I mean, there's a huge amount. It's so fascinating, all of these things. Everything about history is fascinating. Everything yeah. about people is fascinating. And yeah. when you start to look at all of these different components of make, that make us who we are, we're all individuals. We're all ourselves, of course. But there are things that we share um, uh, with history and with other people that's absolutely fascinating. I just want to say um, this is a, a the Oklahoma contingent of the Chicago yeah. Scots, and this was fascinating. Um, all of us who have poured over maps, you have answered a lot of questions that we have had for decades of, of, of the AY at the end of many of the island names. And so thank you. This has just been enlightening. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. I think I love an old map, me, I must admit. I absolutely adore them. And uh, finding out what the stories are, you know, and, and then you find that little story, like I found out about Joran, the, the Viking woman in Lewis. I mean, that's completely unheard of state of affairs in, in um, medieval Europe, that any woman would have had, a, had her name in a place named Atoll, I assure you. It's extraordinary. So you find these little stories, and it's when you know the pieces, you know, you put the pieces of the jigsaw together, um, I, I really hope I didn't throw too much information at you today. The thing is, I get terribly excited about the whole topic and I'm quite prepared to talk for hours on end. <laughs> I think I want to but, again, so to, to absorb even more. Well, thank you. That's very kind words. Yes, we'll be interested in having you back, Donna. Absolutely. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Don. Yeah, um, I had a 23andMe or whatever, Ancestry.com, whatever those things are, uh, done about two years ago. And I had pulses coming from, you know, like Edinburgh and London and Glasgow and stuff. But then I was like uh, Norwegian or Norway, and I was thinking, what the heck is that from? 10% of it. That was one thing. So this is kind of interesting with the Norse angle. Now, the other thing is, uh, Donald, I know it means uh, world ruler, but if you split in two, a Don usually like Don Juan is like a senior and old like Harold or whatever. It's old, old Don. Yeah, old, well, old, old noble. Something like there that. you go. There you, you know, go. We you actually like, you like to split apart words, you know. Well, you see, my name is, is Donna, but I was very lucky to escape the family curse of, of the first name of Donaldina, uh, <laughs> which is the, fa was the family name. You can ask my cousin Dina how she feels about that one. Um, but it's an interesting thing that Donna, which is just an Italian name for lady, a quite modern affair, um, has now replaced Donaldina as the feminine form of Donald in oh. the Western oh. mm. okay. um, mm. uh, Which is uh, probably a relief to quite a few people, I would think. Yeah, but, one uh, final yes. thing. This has been an interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. You know, the place names, it's just always interesting to me. So. It's fascinating, isn't it? And the thing is about place names nowadays that we have a disjunct. When people gave these place names to these places, they meant something. You know, this was the high island. This was the flat island. This was the, the Bay of the Gulls. And so on. And now we don't know, always know what place names mean. So we have a step back, yeah, which is which why when people, yeah, when, they, when, when we Scots and we've been everywhere, including the moon, thank you, Neil Armstrong, right? Um, we take the place names of Scotland with us. For a, diff for a different reason, to remind us of home. They, they're not any more describing the places that we name, they're describing the places that we left and describing the places of our heart, the landscapes of our souls. Is Armstrong Scottish? Oh, I, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, his, 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 his father was a, a, an immigrant from the borders of Scotland. And um, once he came back from the moon, um, I think it was a few months later, he came to the small village in Scotland that his father had come from. And he said, I have come home. And that's what he said. And there's a wonderful picture of a little boy walking in front of Neil Armstrong with a placard saying, my name is Neil Armstrong. Mm. <laughs> because great. it's 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 the uh, it's the uh, homelands of Clan Armstrong, of course. So oh, yes, okay. so I, I don't care. I'm just going to say that we Scots were on the moon as well. That's All I can fine. say is what's in a name? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Donna? You know, about 20 miles uh, north of Kirkwall, where, where you're residing, there is a very significant uh, 
village and archaeological excavation, Scarabray, from the Neolithic and Bronze periods, I believe. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't just ca care to fit in something uh, about Scarabray and, and was that Norse? And uh, oh. just any comments you care to contribute on that subject today? Certainly, I can say a few words. It's, it's, I know it's much, much older than, than, than anything Norse. It's older than the pyramids. It's older than just about everything that you can imagine. When you come to Scarabay, Connie, when you walk down to the village, and what it is, is it's um, a village that was uncovered in the Victorian period. There was a big snow storm, a uh, big, big pardon, storm, and the sand and everything was blown off. And the, the local landowners came out and saw this, this village of stone built houses. Now, in the Neolithic period, people would have built villages, but it's not its not an uncommon village. What's uncommon about it is the fact that it lasted because it's made of stone and not wood. Um, and it is a, it's, uh, they called it Scarabray, which sounds Norse, but that's just a name that they gave to it. I don't think the villagers who lived there would necessarily have called it Scarabray. But uh, um, when it was originally built, it was nearly two miles from the sea. But the sea's in hmm. now. So, so now the waves lap on the shore of, of Scarabay. Oh, wow. And it's a series of interconnected houses. And in, uh, they're actually quite comfortable. I mean, um, there's a there's one of the most iconic images in Scottish history is what you get on the front of your first history book at school. And it is the, the cabinet at Scarabay. It's like an old fashioned Welsh dresser kind of thing with shelves. Now, Scarabay woman, uh, you're basically looking at her. She was about five foot two. She had brown hair, probably, and light coloured eyes and pale skin. Me. Right? <laughs> so, that, that's, so when I go to Scarabay, everything fits beautifully and they have tanks there for the fish and so on. So we're, we're talking about <laughs> something that has been, been there for a very long time. And when you go to Scarabay, Connie, you start, you walk down history. Um, yeah, and the most recent the most recent stone is, is to mark um, Yuri Gagarin's uh, flight into space. Which was actually dedicated by a cosmonaut who knew him. And then we walk all the way back and we go past it, all the things like the Great Wall of China, the pyramids, everything, right back to the dawn of time, and there is Scarabray. So it's very, very um, older than the pyramids. Wow. Oh, well, well much pyramids, pyramids. Right? <laughs> it's it's uh, no, 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 it's incredibly old. It's at least 5,000 years old. Um, I wow. So when you come to uh, Orkney, Connie, we will definitely go and see that. Okay, you got it. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on a lighter note, and I'm, I don't know whether to throw this in or not, but I noticed you had that uh, colored picture ship elevation of the, the Viking longship, and it appeared to be fashioned in design to look like Nessie. It has a... <laughs> Water horse Ooh. on the front face, and I don't know. There may be some truth to to that animal. Well, you know, um, because the ships were so easy to move, they could do portage on them. Uh, they were <laughs> portageurs. They, they did sail in lochs. They sailed in Loch Lomond, for example. The the long ships sailed in Loch Lomond. It may be that they sailed in Loch Ness, and somebody saw them. But the first um, evidence we have for the Loch Ness Monster is, of course, St. Columba um, yes. in the River Ness. And, of course, it's a fine example of St. Columba, you know, with Christianity repelling the pagan atrocities and it banishes Nessie from the River Ness. And so on. I, I hear you've got somebody who's a keen scholar of that was coming in there, too. Um, but that's the first the first instance. But, yes, that's an interesting thought, Connie. It could you know, the the. The, the dragon prows, um, for example, they used to take off the ships when they came into land, so it didn't interfere with the land spirits. So that's the sea spirit mm -hmm. of the dragon. Prow. And of course, they believed that Thor um, uh, was who. You know, they, they had a very close relationship to the gods. That's why there is a rainbow bridge with Heimdall on it to keep the plebs out. Because as far as the Vikings are concerned, there is nowhere you can't go. Right? Mm -hmm. There's no sense of another dimension in that way like the Celts have the, 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 the veil between the worlds. No, no, you could go everywhere. And that's why Heimdall stands there on the, the Rainbow Bridge. Um, and they believed that if they were in distress, that Thor himself would appear on the ship, you know, when they, they did their Thor aid and they called for Thor, um, that he would, he would be there. And he was a, you know, a guy like themselves in many ways, which is why so many stories about Thor, actually, in, in Old Norse end up with him being tricked into wearing a frock or something and being... Um, Thor, I think, Thor was incredibly popular in the colonies, and I think it's because he's a straightforward kind of guy, would play rugby, would be down drinking far too many pints on a, a Friday night, and so on, 
and it's just a, <laughs> you know, an old and straightforward kind of kind of guy, basically. But other uh, questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, questions for Donna. Uh, I have one. Uh, we went to uh, Fernierhurst Castle in Jedburgh, and we're told that the black sheep that are maintained on the property were brought by Norsemen at the uh, initial uh, arrival of the clan and maintained to this day. Are there other clans? Uh, first of all, do you know whether that's true? And second of all, are there other clans that seem to have such direct uh, Norse contacts? Well, yes, I mean, uh, the, the Norse brought quite a few things with them. For example, um, they certainly brought those black sheep with them, but they also brought very tough Viking mice with them. We have in Orkney different kinds of mice on each island, depending on what ships landed there, and they're not taking any nonsense, I can tell you that. Um, so they, they brought this, this is absolutely true folks, folk have done research on them. Um, so they, they brought, um, we also have um, a, a very special kind of sheep in the north that eats the seaweed. Uh, it's kept off the, the land by a dike on North Ronaldsea, for example, and it eats the seaweed and very sought after for its meat, but it can't eat the grass because it can't process the copper in it. So it's very dangerous for them to get in there, but they brought the, all of these, these kinds of things with them. Um, the, the Norse weren't clans as such. Clan is a term that it actually comes from the uh, ancient Irish term kinred or kindreds or kindreds, if you like, and clown, of course, as I'm sure you all know, means children. Clondall, the children of Donald, um, for example. So that's not, that's, the Norse didn't work in that kind of way. Uh, the, it was very much every man for himself in a way, if you like. Uh, you know, for example, the Jarl, you were not obliged to follow him. You were not obliged to turn up with 10 men or anything like that. He had to prove to you that he was a man worth following. And everybody was treated equally. There's an interesting picture that I really drew my attention. It's from 1935 and it's George V of Great Britain, of course, who has come to Kirkhall and the, the whole of the harbour is full of, of men and not one of them have taken their hat off. That's not an insult. That's because they just don't see the need. Right? Because everybody's the same as everybody else. And that's something that we have in Scotland to that sense that you're, you're, it's your, you're judged on your own merits, which which we certainly like to consider is the case and, and, and very often, you know, it is, people can uh, achieve in that way, but it's, it's interesting that it's, we, we don't have that same kind of the feudal system, although clans are not feudal, I hasten to point out, they're more like cooperatives, they're a different thing, um, but uh, we, we, d we didn't have that and I think that's something that reflects our Norse ancestry in many ways, our independent spirit, our search for the it's truth and actually and justice. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Scat free. Yes, scat free. Well, you see, of course, that comes from the, t the term for Norse tax. Scat free. Oh. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, scat is what you see is is the Norse tax. The King of Norway would have. Uh, um, Kirkwall, where I'm speaking to you uh, today, uh, is a royal borough in Scotland, but it was also a Scotland in Norway. So it paid, you know, there was a bit of a hoo-ha about what taxes they paid and to whom, which is why you might like to know that in a very unusual uh, situation, two colonies of Norway, Orkney and Shetland, decided to invade Norway because uh, they were a bit mad about the taxes. And this is called the Raid of the Island Beardies. So all the Orkney and Shetland boys, I'm, I'm sure probably got absolutely tanked up on beer before they did this and set off and... Uh, um, in, in various ships to attack Norway. They did not win, but it's a, certainly a good story and a good number of uh, sagas about that particular thing. So it just shows you the very gallus, if I can use that Scots word, the very bold nature, pertinacious nature of, of the Norse component of Scotland. Well, Donna, we, we can't thank you enough for being with us today. And I am going to ensure you that we will be inviting you back. Uh, your talk has been fascinating and enlightening, and uh, you're, you're, it's just very highly valued. So thank you so much. And I also want to thank Gus and, for being with us today and making the time. And Jack, I want to thank you for everything you do for us. And friends, I, I thank you as well for joining us. And I do hope you'll uh, join again next month. On April 2nd, 
when we have Dr. Alistair Mann from the Department of History, University of Sterling, returning to us to discuss the Council, the Union, and the Patriot, the Scottish Privy Council, Anglo-Scottish Union, and Andrew, Andrew Fletcher of Saltoon. So same time, same station, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. And Donna, let's give Donna a round of applause. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. And until then, be safe and thank you. Donna, I'll be in touch. Be well, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.